You're listening to the Hayek Program Podcast. This podcast includes audio from lectures, interviews, and discussions from scholars and visitors of the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. To learn more about the Hayek Program, visit ppe.mercatus.org. My name is Chris Coyne, and I'm the F.A. Harper Professor of Economics at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University and the Associate Director of the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics. Today I'm joined by Robert Higgs, who is a Senior Fellow in Political Economy at the Independent Institute and is the Editor-at-Large of the Institute's quarterly journal, The Independent Review. Bob, welcome. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, let's begin, uh, if you don't mind, by telling me a bit about your growth as an economist uh, and your evolution from graduate school to the present and uh, how your thought changed over time. Well, I actually uh, started graduate school at the University of California at Santa Barbara, uh, and that was in 1965. And uh, uh, the program there was very uh, conventional. It looked a lot like other leading programs in uh, economics at the time. Uh, but I only remained there for one year, and I transferred to Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, and that's where I completed my PhD work in 1968. Uh, Hopkins was a very good place to be a student. It was a relatively small graduate program compared to others of similar quality at the time. Um, but the substance of what I was uh, taught there was uh, very similar to what was being taught at other leading uh, uh, graduate programs in the country. And uh, uh, at that time, in the mid-1960s, of course, uh, the, uh, the neoclassical synthesis was uh, riding high, which meant that we were, we were combining uh, uh, a kind of Keynesian economics training uh, uh, with, with some attention to competing points of view uh, uh, with a kind of uh, uh, modern welfare economics uh, approach to microeconomics with uh, a lot of uh, emphasis on market failures and uh, a lot of uh, attention to modeling. In fact, uh, my whole graduate education was uh, in large part viewed as a, uh, a learning how to model, uh, what models are, what models ought to do, uh, the necessary conditions for building a good model, uh, and making sure that we had equilibrium, stability, and enough equations to, uh, to solve the problem, <laughs> things of that sort. So it was rather technical. Uh, none of my professors was uh, anything like an ideologue. I was uh, not even aware that one of my professors was a, a well-known Chicago School economist because he taught econometrics, and uh, all I knew was that he taught econometrics, and, uh, and he did not uh, wear his Chicago School uh, views on his sleeve. Uh, and. Uh, other professors were similar in, in that uh, they were more interested in the, the techniques of economics. Uh, they viewed economics as a box of tools. And one could reach into that box and pull out the appropriate tool to, uh, to model a particular economic problem. So that was the way I was trained, uh, in a very mainstream, conventional way. Now, uh, when I first began to work uh, as a professor in 1968, uh, I was at the University of Washington in Seattle. And uh, uh, a small group of people there, but uh, an influential group, uh, were uh, uh, PhDs from Chicago. And uh, those colleagues had very definite ideas about what good economics uh, was and what it wasn't. And uh, they were very much at war with uh, the neoclassical synthesis uh, in pretty much every respect. Uh, but uh, they, were, they were certainly not uh, even acquainted, I think, with Austrian economics, which I, I discovered uh, by accident on a reading list one of them used, which had an article, famous, very famous article by Hayek from 1945 on the use of knowledge in society. And, uh, and uh, I read the article because I developed an interest in graduate school in the, in the economics of information, which was a, a Chicago school uh, endeavor uh, in large part at the time. George Stigler was a leading contributor to that 
subfield of economics. And so I thought the, the Hayek article was probably about the economics of information. And in fact, when I read it, uh, that's the way I thought about it. This is an, another contribution to the same sort of inquiry that Stigler's been carrying on. Uh, so it took me a while to start to understand what Austrian economics was about and how it differed particularly in its epistemological and methodological foundations. But what I did uh, as a result of reading that Hayek article was become interested in Hayek's work. And so I began to find and read more of Hayek's writing. And uh, not long afterwards, I read Hayek's great book, The Constitution of Liberty. And I was uh, just uh, in amazingly impressed by the, the scholarship of the book. Uh, I was not used to reading authors who, uh, who commanded four or five different languages and who had a close acquaintance with a lot of history and philosophy and, uh, and other things outside economics. But uh, Hayek was, of course, an amazingly broad uh, and deep scholar. And so uh, reading his work uh, was very influential for me. I didn't understand at the time, however, and, and for a number of years later, that I couldn't simply read Hayek and profit from what he had to say and just add that to or integrate it with uh, what I'd been taught before in neoclassical economics. I, I, it took a long time for me to realize that uh, Austrian economics has such distinct epistemological and methodological foundations that integration is, uh, is difficult or impossible. You know, people, of course, di differ on whether they think it's impossible or not. But however that may be, uh, it was about 10 years later after I'd started reading Hayek that I ultimately read uh, uh, Mises' book, uh, Human Action. Uh, and I read it from cover to cover and it had uh, a powerful effect on my thinking. In fact, it, it made me feel for, for some time that I'd just wasted 10 years of my life, uh, that uh, everything I'd written and published was crap, and that uh, it wouldn't stand up uh, to the kinds of arguments that Mises brought against uh, neoclassical economics of the kind I was uh, practicing at the time. Uh, I later uh, developed a more charitable view of what I'd done in those 10 years. And, uh, but that required that I recharacterize what I had thought I was doing when I did it. Uh, but at all events, uh, I began to become more interested in Austrian economics and to use that as a foundation for my work, which continued to be mainly in economic history for a number of years. And then from the 1980s on, uh, began to extend into subjects in political economy, uh, sometimes contemporary subjects rather than historical subjects. And eventually, I, uh, I deepened my understanding of Austrian economics. I, I discovered many other Austrian writers, including Murray Rothbard and, and Israel Kirzner and, uh, and others. And uh, so eventually, I really had a better understanding of not only Austrian economics, but the distinctions between that and mainstream neoclassical economics. What do you view as some of the key distinctions between Austrian economics and mainstream economics? Uh, I think there's several. One of them is that Austrian economics uh, treats subjectivism as a very serious matter and keeps it in mind at all times. Uh, there's a tendency in neoclassical economics to recognize subjectivism uh, when one first starts thinking about utility theory and then to forget it and to fall into formalism and to fall into the implicit if not explicit assumption that things that are not measurable can be measured. Uh, and to begin to think that third parties can assess costs, for example, uh, the whole basis of cost-benefit analysis, uh, which is a kind of subfield of neoclassical economics, presumes that uh, 
costs and benefits can be measured by third parties. And of course, sometimes people will say, well, that's because we measure them via market prices. But because there are no market prices for many of the costs and benefits uh, these analysts are trying to assess, they have to fall into other forms of third party evaluation or appraisal. And when they do that, they're really uh, not only overlooking a thorough subjectivism, but they're abandoning it. They're, they're uh, working in a way that is contrary to it. They're presuming that third parties can know things that indeed cannot be known by any third parties, but only by the decision makers themselves. So uh, subjectivism is one of the, the key differences. Um, uh, there's also a great difference in uh, the extent to which Austrians think formalism is a valuable thing for its own sake. Uh, modern uh, neoclassical economics is dominated by formal analysis. Uh, I've encountered many people who, who re reacted to work of different kinds, including sometimes my own work, uh, basically by saying, if you've got no formal model, you've got nothing. In other words, there's this insistence that there's only one way to do economics. It's by formal mathematical modeling. And if you try to get economic knowledge or information by any other means, you're just wasting your time. Uh, there's no hope for any, any other alternative way of learning about economic life. Uh, Austrians uh, disavow that kind of formalism. Uh, some Austrians certainly appreciate that formal models can be revealing, they can be insightful. But they have to be formulated very carefully to avoid the pitfalls of making assumptions that one knows what cannot be known by anyone but the actors. And uh, that's a pitfall that's in general not avoided in neoclassical economics. Uh, there's a lot of presumption. Hayek complained again and again and again that people were assuming away in their analysis what uh, in fact was uh, the core of what we were trying to understand. They were simply assuming that people knew things like all the, all the prevailing prices in the market, when what people were trying to do was to discover prices at which they could uh, buy or sell, or might buy or sell, or uh, discovering the prices at which they eventually did agree to buy and sell, and that that discovery procedure was ongoing. It was constant. It was not something that the world would stop well, while the neoclassical economist solved his equations and said, ah, that's the equilibrium set of prices. Uh, so I think the, the, the formal modeling question is a, a huge distinction between uh, Austrians and neoclassical e economists. Um, I think there's also a, a difference in that uh, Austrians tend to think in terms of the process of economic life. Whereas neoclassical economists think in terms of equilibrium configurations. They, 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 they search for the equilibrium of a model. And even if it's said to be a dynamic model, it still has a definite equilibrium trajectory that is the answer to the question they've posed. Uh, but whether it's static or dynamic, uh, it's still the case that they're, they're treating the problem as, as it were, fixed. Uh, you, you can work toward the answer, and voila, you've got it. Uh, and of course, if you use welfare economics, you can say, for example, oh, this is, a, this is an answer. It tells me the world is inefficient. So that means that the government could intervene uh, in ways that would move it toward an efficient configuration. Uh, Austrians uh, treat efficiency very differently. They treat efficiency as basically whatever free traders in the market do, that's efficient. Uh, because no one else can say that something would be better. No one else has the information to displace the actual actor's evaluations of costs and benefits. So those would be some of the major differences I would uh, think of between uh, Austrian economics and neoclassical economics. There, there are a number of others, and uh, if one wants to talk about philosophical and uh, epistemological questions, uh, uh, there are certainly some there too.
I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about uh, one of the uh, main themes in your work, which is the growth of government. Uh, and it, I want to focus on your 1987 book, Crisis and Leviathan. Uh, and in that book, you put forth this idea of the ratchet effect. Uh, you, you develop this framework, and then you apply it to a, a host of historical episodes in the growth of government. Uh, and so uh, can you tell me a little bit about the ratchet effect framework? Um, what it entails, and also how it helps to explain the growth of government, uh, both historically, but also how it applies to more uh, contemporary issues as well. Well, the ratchet effect uh, in the abstract is is the idea that uh, something is moving in, in only one direction, uh, at least to the extent that if it moves in that direction, it can't be fully returned to the direction or location where it was before. Most people know about ratchet wrenches for tightening uh, nuts on bolts. And so you keep moving the lever in the same direction and pulling it back and forth, but you don't loosen the boat, you, bolt, you only tighten it, or vice versa. Uh, a ratchet effect in, in relation to the growth of government is a, a phenomenon in which government grows, uh, uh, perhaps during some discrete episode, and I've focused on national emergency periods. But it grows abruptly, and then it, it later uh, declines. But it doesn't decline back to where it was before the episode, uh, or even uh, to where it would have been had the previous uh, growth trajectory continued, uh, instead of being displaced by the events of the, of the, um, the lurch. Uh, now, a lot of economists have studied the growth of government, and the general tendency has been to study it as a trend phenomenon. If we look back a century or more, we can measure in various ways how big the government was, and uh, we, we now see by those same measures that it's much bigger. And so the idea is to more or less to connect the dots or you know, to put in all the intervening data and then uh, draw a trend line through them. And then the objective is to explain why that trend uh, slopes upward as it does. Uh, now, if one, if one does uh, look at all the intervening observations in a long period of growth uh, of government such as that, what one sees is not, however, a, a, a movement along a smooth trend line. Uh, there are some economic and social data that do move smoothly like that. Uh, if you look, for example, at the growth of population over the last uh, uh, century or, or so in the United States, you'd see a very, very smooth uh, growth trend. It, uh, its rate of growth may shift a little bit uh, from time to time, but you could draw a trend line through the population values for the United States over the last century, and it would fit very closely the actual yearly observations. Uh, but uh, if you looked at a, uh, any of the common measures of the size of government during that same period, you would not find uh, a, uh, a trend line uh, tracked closely the actual movements of the, of the size of government. You would find instead that there were a number of discrete episodes, especially those uh, of, associated with the two world wars and uh, uh, the Great Depression of the 1930s, uh, and to some extent uh, later, uh, a period from the early 1960s to the early 1970s, and then later than that, a period uh, from 2008 uh, for the next several years, uh, three or four years at least, in which once again you had a discrete lurch in many measures of the size of government. So uh, I was... Uh, uh, drawn to uh, try to understand what relation, if any, exists between these aberrant periods of sudden growth in the size of government and the fact that there's a long-run upward trend. Are they just independent, for example? Many economists had treated them as independent. In fact, some economists had performed their analyses by excluding these periods from the analysis, especially the war years. They said, well, that's that's not what we're trying to understand. We're trying to understand why, over the long run, the government has grown bigger. And it won't help us if we look at statistical outliers. Uh, that was how they conceived of these, these uh, particular episodes. 
Uh, as an economic historian, I, I had learned a good deal about the details of what happened during these particular national emergency periods. And uh, it seemed to me right away that uh, to throw them out of the analysis uh, was to throw out uh, information that was actually critical to understanding the long-run movements. Uh, that indeed, uh, what happened during these national emergency periods uh, was critical to the fact that there was a long-run upward trend in the growth of government. That without them, that trend might have leveled off even, or even reversed itself conceivably at some point. So I began to work uh, with a focus on uh, the national emergency periods to try to integrate them into the study of the, of the long-run growth of, of government. And uh, my book, Crisis and Leviathan, which you mentioned, uh, published in 1987, uh, was the product of about five years of work along those lines in which I uh, studied the period from the late 19th century to the late 20th century uh, when, when the book was published. Now, uh, there's a way to stylize uh, one's conception of the ratchet effect, uh, which is to divide it into phases. Uh, actual historical processes don't fall into patterns nearly so neatly. But uh, it's very helpful to stylize the uh, conception of the ratchet effect. And, and so uh, the five phases I identify are the, the pre-crisis normality. Uh, that's when nothing unusual is happening. Uh, government may be growing, uh, but if so, it's probably growing fairly slowly. Uh, uh, then at the onset of a national emergency, uh, government begins to take actions that result in quite significant, unusual growth of government's size, scope, and power. Uh, that is, government begins to do a lot of things it wasn't doing before, uh, or it begins to do some of the things it was doing before uh, at a much higher level. Uh, then the, the third phase uh, is uh, the crisis phase itself. The crisis it takes a while to, to play out before it passes away, and during that phase, the government remains at a high level of operation. Uh, crises in the past have always ended, and when they've ended, as say the wars ended, uh, then uh, there's always been some retrenchment. Some of the government actions taken during phase two, uh, the upward lurch, are abandoned or scaled back. But uh, the retrenchment uh, has, in all these major episodes, been incomplete. So that when we arrive at phase five, uh, the post-crisis normality, government may be growing no faster than it was before the crisis, but even if so, it's growing uh, from a higher level. So the trajectory of the long-run growth of government is displaced upward by each of these crisis episodes. and. Uh, in my historical work, I've uh, tried in a variety of ways uh, uh, to discover uh, why it is that the retrenchment is incomplete. And there are several reasons why I believe that is the case. Now, other economists had studied uh, ratchet effects. Uh, uh, perhaps the most notable previous study was by uh, Peacock and Wiseman, two British economists who had who had uh, used this uh, notion to describe the, uh, the growth of uh, fiscal variables in, uh, in Great Britain during the early part of the 20th century. And Peacock and Wiseman had discovered, for example, that uh, British spending, government spending, or uh, British government taxation uh, revenues had all been displaced uh, tremendously upward during each of the world wars and, and then fallen back after the wars but not back fully to the pre-crisis level and so there there had been a, a definite ratchet effect in britain as a result of each of the world wars uh, almost everybody who studied ratchets or thought about them uh, before my work uh, had thought about them in term in terms of fiscal variables uh, because that was the normal way economists 
had measured and continue to measure the size of government. How much money does it spend? How much tax revenue does it collect? How many people uh, does it employ? Uh, sometimes how much money does it borrow? Uh, how much does it guarantee in private loans or whatever? There are many ways to measure the magnitude of government's current activity. But all of these are, are ways that economists like because there are quantitative data that can be found uh, to, to uh, describe what's happened and to analyze it econometrically. As, I, as I've said before, many economists think if you can't model something, you don't have anything. So if you're going to fit a, an econometric model to, to the growth of government, you need some quantitative data that will facilitate your doing so. Now my conception of the ratchet effect in the growth of government is, is quite different because my conception of what we mean by the size of government is, is more complete, I think. Uh, I'm interested not only in the level at which government operates, how much does it spend, for example. I'm interested also in the scope of government activity. How many uh, questions that were previously answered by private parties uh, in, the, in uh, the private sector of the economy uh, have now come to be answered by government officials, legislators, or bureaucrats. Uh, when, when there's an increase uh, in, in government's decision making that displaces uh, that same kind of decision making previously made by private parties without interference from government, then we have an increase in the scope of government. So uh, government over time has become involved in many, many things it was not previously involved in. And that widening of the scope uh, is a very important way in which government changes the operation uh, of economic life. Uh, even though it may not necessarily spend uh, a great deal more money, and sometimes it, it won't necessarily spend any more money. It, it simply broadens the authority it exercises over private decision making, and it may use that authority in ways that show up in private accounts. For example, if government uh, takes responsibility for, for pollution control, it may uh, pass laws or create agencies like the EPA that tell people they have to take certain actions to, to prevent pollution or to moderate the extent of it. Uh, but when private parties undertake those uh, compliance actions, that's money spent on the account of firms or individuals, not money spent uh, on the EPA's account. So uh, an increase in the scope of uh, government activity is, is critically important, uh, as well as an increase in the uh, amount of money spent or the number of people hired uh, on the government payroll. And the third uh, aspect of government that I include in my notion of the size of government, and therefore in my notion of the ratchet effect, is government's power. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, government exerts its power, uh, changes uh, the degree of power it exerts uh, in ways that don't show up either in measures of scope or scale. Uh, uh, recently, for example, the government has undertaken to, to uh, impose mass surveillance on the entire population and not only the entire population of the United States, but uh, and m many people in the rest of the world as well. So the activities of uh, government agencies like the uh, NSA and, uh, uh, have placed people's electronic communications under surveillance in a massive way. Uh, and uh, the government is now uh, exercising this, 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 this power of surveillance uh, which places all private actors under a cloud of suspicion. They're being watched by government because, because government thinks they are potential criminals, they're potential terrorists, they're potential wrongdoers uh, of some kind, child molesters, tax evaders, drug dealers, uh, you name it. But uh, it turns out that once you put people under mass surveillance and you're watching everybody and accumulating information on their emails and their phone calls and any other form of communication that leaves an electronic trail, uh, you put the government in a position to be very selective about whom it uh, prosecutes, whom it goes after, in some cases uh, whom it kills uh, peremptorily, uh, as, as it does now uh, killing people uh, in many parts of the world with, with drone rockets. 
So uh, this increase in the power of government through the use of surveillance is a critically important thing, but if you were looking at normal measures of government's scale or scope, you might miss it altogether. So uh, I've been at pains throughout my work to, to pay attention to uh, the size, scope, and power of government and to see how all of those things have changed during episodes uh, I characterized as uh, evincing the ratchet effect. Another related theme in, in Christ and Leviathan that I think is very important that you emphasize is this notion of institutional possibilities. Uh, and so even when you have some retrenchment, uh, things lay dormant. Uh, yes. There's a precedent there. Right. In some cases, there's an actual bureaucratic apparatus, which might shrink slightly, but it's there still. Yes. Uh, and, and when that will emerge again is unknowable. It might be years, it might be decades. Um, and you know, the NSA is a, a very good example of that. Um, you know, it was created in the 50s, but you know, its history is much further back than that. Mm -hmm. uh, and no one could have predicted at the time yeah. how it would look in the um, post 9-11 world. Now, uh, I'm curious what you think about, uh, what, with what you just said about the, the post 9-11 world, because where many of the national emergencies that you discuss in Christ and Leviathan seem to have somewhat of a clear endpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, it, right now, the United States is engaged in a, a, a war that has no clear end, numerous wars that have mm -hmm. no clear end. Mm -hmm. uh, the main one, what, what people call the war on terror, but that's linked mm -hmm. up with the war on drugs and all the other ongoing wars. Right. Um, so, so how do you see that fitting into to your framework um, in terms of the fact that there, you know, it's unclear that there'll ever be a retrenchment or, or a clear end point, because it's unclear what victory even means. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it's a very troubling development. Uh, uh, I think you know, one needs to understand that in all of these episodes, there were people who didn't want the retrenchment, even after uh, an episode such as World War II. There were people, for example, who didn't want the government to abandon its price controls, for example, at the, at the end of the war. Uh, there were always people, sometimes the those who managed the government agencies and sometimes outsiders who benefited from the operations of these agencies who wanted to keep the government doing whatever it had done for a war purpose uh, or an anti-depression purpose during the New Deal, for example. Uh, so there are, there are always uh, people in or close to the government uh, who would like to have the government operate at a higher level that is reached as a result of emergency actions. Uh, now, the, the question in the past has always been, can, can the people who want to keep the government operating at this extraordinary level succeed? Because there are others who, who want retrenchment. They want, they want to get rid of, for example, price controls in 1945. You know, a lot of businessmen then were sick of price controls. They didn't like to file reports with the Office of Price Administration. They didn't like to have people snooping on the prices they charge or interfering with how much they, they, could, they could charge customers. Uh, so there was a lot of opposition to keeping the price controls. Now, uh, if we come up to the, the present and the, uh, and the post 9-11 uh, developments, uh, we, we have in a way a similar uh, give and take there. We, we have some people who, who, who want to keep the government operating at a, at a very high uh, level of action overseas, uh, just as the, the government used 9-11 as a pretext for attacking Iraq and occupying the country for over a decade. And of course, U.S. forces remain in Iraq even now, although in diminished numbers. But uh, U.S. forces operating still in Afghanistan, as they, they have since immediately after 9-11, uh, operating in many other parts of the world. So supposedly because of, uh, of the threat that was manifested on 9-11. Uh, now, obviously, uh, some people think this is overwrought. They think this is inappropriate. They think uh, it's not con really connected with uh, the perpetrators of 9-11, they think the United States has used this as a pretext to become involved in foreign civil wars that are unrelated to, uh, to anything that happened in 9-11. Uh, so there, there is some uh, opposition to the idea that government should continue to do everything it did immediately after 9-11 on the basis of, uh, 
of reacting to, to that horrible event. Uh, however, uh, the war on terror is an unusual kind of crisis uh, or reaction to crisis because uh, obviously conventional war has to end at some point. Even historically, the 30 years of war went on a long time, but it ended. The 100 years of war <laughs> ended. It took a long time. But if you have uh, uh, something like a war on terror, uh, it's not a war on a definite enemy. It's a war on a tactic, a tactic that can be carried out by virtually any, any adult. You or I could commit a terroristic act. Uh, we, we have automobiles. Uh, we could drive into a crowd and kill people. Uh, terrorism is available to almost anybody who wants to carry it out. Uh, it doesn't require that we blow up an airplane or, or a, a hotel or a government office. Uh, it can be done in a variety of ways uh, just to create terror. And uh, so the whole idea of fighting terror is senseless, basically. Now, it's always linked uh, in the past 15 years or so, it's always linked with with the Islamist uh, radicals in uh, various parts of the Middle East and Africa and Asia uh, who have been, been characterized as the, uh, the great devils of the day, you know, the, uh, the threat du jour. Uh, we don't have Hitler anymore, we don't have Stalin anymore, but now we have Islamist fanatics. And uh, we don't know who they all are, where they are, what they plan to do. Uh, we do know that there are some people in the world uh, who are intent on committing acts of terrorism against uh, Americans or Europeans or, in some cases, uh, Asians, Africans. Uh, there are some people that uh, would like to commit acts of terror in, uh, as part of a political program uh, to seek power in these places or, in many cases, to uh, eject American and other European forces from their countries. So uh, there's no doubt that there are terrorists and would-be terrorists in the world. But uh, that's been the case for a long time. Uh, and uh, terrorism can be and uh, would more profitably be treated as a form of crime. Uh, to treat it as a, a, a form of warfare in the same way that conventional warfare takes place uh, is a recipe for enlarging the state, uh, sacrificing people's liberties uh, in a quest that never ends, as you say. How can anyone ever be sure that terrorism has been defeated? It's not a foe. We can't kill every terrorist because some new terrorist could come into being at any moment. So uh, it's, a, uh, uh, it's an ideal uh, mission for those people who do not want retrenchments of government size, scope, and power and particularly for those people who enjoy or profit from the government's operation of the war and terror at a high level. We need to understand that it's not just the people who run the NSA or the CIA that gain from having a war on terror. It's also the many, many, many companies and consulting uh, firms that contract with uh, the Pentagon or the CIA or the NSA, uh, and there are, there are thousands of them. Uh, uh, where people are earning large amounts of money for carrying out some research or some production activity uh, ostensibly related to uh, fighting the war on terror. And so this, uh, this activity now has built into it a very large and well-heeled uh, private sector of crony capitalists tied to the government agencies most responsible for conducting the war on terror. And for that reason, it's much harder to bring about a retrenchment. Every time some retrenchment is proposed, uh, the, the people who stand to gain from its continuation cry out that that would be uh, undesirable. It would uh, open us up to attack by enemies. It would, uh, it would place us at greater risk. Uh, we would be asking for harm. Uh, uh, which is a very cheap form of talk because they don't have to do much to justify it, but it's the kind of talk that has some effect. That's why they, they talk that way again and again and again. All crises managers uh, are familiar with using fear to manage the public. Uh, during crises, government wants to 
impose costs on the public in a way that it hasn't before, or uh, it wants to require them to take actions they weren't taking before. And in order to gain compliance, in order to get people to, to acquiesce in the government's exercise of these new powers at the expense of people's liberties, it needs to make them afraid. Uh, that's the best way to make them uh, desist from resistance uh, or evasion. So all crisis management is tied up with fear management. And uh, anybody who even watches uh, daily television programs knows there's a fear du jour. There's a fear almost every day. And practically every one of these fears has tied to it some government response or some proposal for a government response, whether it's a, a new epidemic on the horizon or a new jihadist group in uh, some far, far away part of the world. Uh, the solution or the response is always seen nowadays as some government response not just leaving it to other people to, to take care of it. So uh, I think the, the war on terror has been a, a, a disastrous development because of the way the US government and allied governments have responded to it uh, and because these responses have, among other things, had the effect of continually creating new terrorists. Every time the United States drops a rocket on a village in Yemen or Afghanistan, uh, they kill a lot of innocent people, and they, they make people who otherwise wouldn't have hated the United States and Americans enough to engage in terrorism, they make them hate the United States that much. They, the United States anti-terrorism program grows its own new crop of terrorists virtually every day. Thank you very much. What I'd like to talk about is uh, a, a part of your scholarship uh, which focuses on making significant contributions to both our understanding of the Great Depression and World War II. Uh, and the orthodox story uh, that is typically uh, put forth as it relates to these events is that significant government spending due to World War II is what got the United States out of the Great Depression. You have spent a lot of uh, your career uh, exploring this question from a variety of aspects and developing an alternative perspective uh, on the relationship between government spending for the purposes of the war and for the Great Depression and the recovery from the Depression. Uh, so tell me a little bit about uh, your work in this area and um, the arguments that you put forth and, and how it relates or differs from, I should say, the conventional story. Uh. I started out uh, my own work on the uh, Great Depression uh, by focusing on the early part of it, uh, the Great Contraction of 1929 to 33, and, and then particularly the uh, response, uh, first by the Hoover administration and then on a much uh, wider scale by the Roosevelt administration from the spring of 1933 onward. And uh, uh, that work is uh, reported in large part in my book, Crisis and Leviathan. But the, the Great Depression can be characterized in, in several different ways. Uh, and I've called them, uh, uh, first of all, the Great Contraction, which I just mentioned. Uh, secondly is uh, what I call the Great Duration. It's the fact that uh, this depression uh, ran for more than a decade. Uh, without full recovery, and it's unique in that respect. Uh, there's never been another uh, depression in U.S. economic history uh, in which the economy went for more than even, say, five years uh, without full recovery. Um, uh, so the great duration is, is kind of a puzzle distinct from why the great contraction took place in the early part of the decade. Uh, and then finally, there's the question of what I call the Great Escape. When, when did the Depression end? What, what got it out of uh, its depressed con condition? Uh, and uh, when I began to think uh, seriously about understanding the Great Duration, um, I, I knew from my, my reading uh, already that, uh, that the Roosevelt administration had had changed its character uh, 
uh, between the first couple of years uh, in office, 1933, 34, uh, and uh, the remaining years, uh, particularly those starting in 1935 and uh, running up into the end of the, of the decade. Uh, and historians have, uh, have sometimes called these the first New Deal and the second New Deal. Uh, now, one can overdo that distinction because some of the same kinds of things happened in, in both uh, phases. Uh, but uh, I think it's a worthwhile distinction to consider uh, because during the, uh, the first couple of years of the Roosevelt administration, uh, the, uh, the government attempted to, to uh, integrate um, uh, many uh, private business interests into its program, particularly its program to, uh, to, to, to recover uh, or, or to bring about economic recovery from the depressed conditions of 1933, which were, 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 were very severe indeed. Uh, and also to some extent to integrate uh, private and business interests in, into its uh, de programs for reforming the economy. So uh, many historians have talked about three aspects of the New Deal, relief, uh, recovery, and reform. And again, uh, they're not all completely distinct. Some, some things uh, have an element of, of each, uh, or more than one at least. But uh, uh, what happened uh, was that uh, opposition to the New Deal developed uh, uh, quite rapidly, even though Roosevelt was a very popular president uh, early in, in his presidency, um, not everybody liked what he was doing, and not everybody liked him. And it, it wasn't just Republicans who, who opposed uh, the New Deal program that he had uh, supported or, or uh, created. So. Uh, Opponents began to rise up here and there, and uh, uh, many of them were, 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 were what you might call crazies. Uh, they, they were really uh, bizarre people uh, with bizarre programs. Uh, now anyone here in, 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 in 2016 can understand that bizarre people may rise up and become important politically. <laughs> but, uh, they certainly rose up. All the, uh, the crackpots came out of the woodwork uh, in the 1930s. And they had all kinds of schemes for, for economic recovery or economic reform. And uh, some of these people uh, gained a huge following. Uh, Huey Long, who, who had been a governor of Louisiana and then became a senator, U.S. senator from Louisiana, uh, began to campaign. Uh, obviously with an eye toward the 1936 election uh, for the presidency. Uh, and even though uh, Huey Long was a, a Democrat, uh, he, he was anything but a New Dealer. He, he, on the floor of the Senate, would speak with total contempt for the president and for the president's <laughs> main uh, subordinates and, uh, and rail against them and what they were doing. And, uh, and Huey was a, a kind of populist demagogue. Uh, and his idea was that uh, they needed to give away more stuff. Uh, the government needed to give away more benefits of some kind to help common people. And uh, Huey gained a huge following. Uh, and Roosevelt was concerned about this potential opponent for his reelection in 1936. Uh, there was a, a man named Dr. Townsend, Francis Townsend in California, who was a doctor. And uh, he developed a, a Townsend plan, which was, was to give, give everybody over 60 years of age uh, $200 every month. The government would just send them a check. Uh, but they had to spend the money by the end of the month. <laughs> so the idea was that the government, that the economy was depressed and it was because not enough money was being spent. You know, businesses were not earning enough profits to expand their employment. So, so they could be solved by the government simply paying all these older people uh, uh, money that, you know, presumably came from thin air. The treasurer would just write them a check. <laughs> 
And the arithmetic didn't really add up, but that didn't matter because a lot of people loved the idea of the Townsend Plan, and uh, hundreds of Townsend Clubs sprang up all over the United States in which people said, yes, we support this, we'd like to see this done. And uh, uh, there, were, there, were, there were a multitude of other crackpots that sprang up with, with more or less populistic type ideas. So Roosevelt was basically being attacked by crackpots from the left. And uh, of course the Republicans were attacking him as well, but uh, they didn't pose the same threat to him because the Republicans were more or less discredited by the events that, that occurred during Hoover's presidency. And so they could continue to be blamed for, for the, the dire condition in which the country had fallen. So, uh, so Roosevelt was not so worried about Republicans uh, as he was about Democratic opponents. So in order to uh, avert that threat, or to cut it off at the knees, uh, starting particularly in 1935, very definitely, Roosevelt shifted his ground. He began to give up trying to compromise with business interests, to cooperate with them, uh, and instead he began to uh, take a, a more radical turn and to support measures that uh, he hadn't supported in the first two years. And uh, probably the two most important uh, measures, uh, uh, which were in fact enacted into law in 1935, were, were, were the National Labor Relations Act, which was uh, a, a large scale labor law that gave labor unions uh, privileges uh, and um, powers to organize uh, and to retain their organizations and to cripple opposition by employers. Uh, that had never existed before. The government had never given a legal basis to labor union organization nearly as strong as what it did in this so-called Wagner Act, the National Labor Relations Act of 1935. Uh, so Roosevelt supported that uh, and he also supported the Social Security Act of that year, which uh, was related to the Townsend uh, plan type thinking uh, because it created old age pensions, not lavish ones like Townsend's, but it created old age pensions, it created a, a system of state unemployment uh, benefits, it created uh, uh, benefits for widows and orphans and uh, blind and disabled people and so forth. It's a very broad scale welfare state measure and that was the first time the United States had done anything like a broad-scale welfare state program. Uh, the previous ones had always been for particular groups or, or very limited. Uh, but now the, the country was basically launched into, into a new era as a welfare state managed at the federal level. Previously, local governments and state governments to some extent had undertaken welfare state type measures, but there again they were limited by financial constraints and, and by ideological constraints as well. But when the Roosevelt administration uh, went in that direction with the Wagner Act and the Social Security Act, it was, it was raising its flag over a uh, kind of collectivism that the federal government had never supported in the past. And there were many other measures as well uh, that moved in the same direction of strengthening the federal government, of expanding its scope, of getting it involved in, in all sorts of activities uh, for regulating private business, including regulation of uh, the issuance of uh, securities by, by uh, private firms, uh, issue, uh, the regulation of labor relations, uh, regulation of particular industries, uh, prices and uh, profits. And, uh, and it went on and on and on. But the drift of it was that the Roosevelt administration's turn in 1935 uh, put it much more in opposition to uh, business interests than before, and Roosevelt himself changed the nature of his rhetoric starting then. Uh, he began to attack investors and bankers and to blame them for the depression and to blame them for the continuation of the depression and to say that uh, in some cases uh, there was a strike of capital. Private investment had never come close to recovering uh, back to its level of the 1920s, late 1920s. Uh, and indeed it never did recover fully uh, for the whole decade of the 1930s. Uh, 
Uh, and everybody understood that that was a major reason for the great duration. That was why the economy as a whole had not recovered, is that private investment projects were, were, were not forthcoming, particularly long-term investments. And so Roosevelt uh, began to rail against uh, private businessmen and to blame them for the Depression and to blame them for all sorts of other evils and to characterize them as economic royalists and to claim that they wanted to establish industrial dictatorships and so forth. It was really violent rhetoric. Uh, no president had ever talked about private businessmen before in uh, such language. And the combination of the president's rhetoric and the change in the subordinates he had close to him in 1935, more radical people, more uh, leftist people, fewer business people, fewer people sympathetic to business interests. The change in the character of the administration's makeup, uh, the change in the president's rhetoric, the change in the nature of the legislation that was enacted or proposed, all these things added up to a much more hostile environment for business in general and particularly for investors. Because investors are people who take large sums of money and spend it right now to create projects which will, if they're lucky, return a stream of income over a long period of time in the future that will be sufficient to justify their current outlays. Well, that means uh, you, you place your money at, at risk. Uh, if, if something happens to prevent you from realizing the gains you foresee when you make the investment, uh, then you've just thrown away good money. So a businessman began to develop a lot of fear, uh, a new kind of fear. They'd always said economic fears, of course. No, no one can be sure that consumers will buy what he wants to sell and, or that technology will not uh, leapfrog over the kind of technology he's invested in or what have you. So there are always many risks whenever investments are made that are purely market risks. Uh, but now investors face a new kind of political risk, the risk that their private property rights might be overridden by a radical government that would regulate them into oblivion or tax them so heavily they wouldn't be able to make any profit on their investments uh, or uh, eventually perhaps even seize their property. The, and this was not as far-fetched as it might seem in retrospect today because if one looked around the world, one saw perfectly civilized countries such as Italy and Germany where precisely such things had happened and were being done at the time. So, so it, it was not crazy if businessmen became very, very afraid of the administration. Now, that's not to say all businessmen turned against the, admi the administration. They didn't. And the Roosevelt administration had its crony capitalists, just as every other administration before and since has had its, their crony capitalists. But uh, nonetheless, overall, uh, there was a big change starting in 1935 and becoming more and more frantic in 1936 and 37, particularly as the labor unions began to organize more rapidly than ever before, and they began to use uh, unprecedented tactics such as sit-in strikes where strikers would go in a plant uh, or, or, or the workers there would stay in the plant. They wouldn't work, they would strike, but they wouldn't leave either. So they would just get in the way and prevent the operation of the property. Uh, so th this was a kind of a trespass and in many places local authorities, governors or, 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 or local police, mayors, would, would, would not take any action to evict these workers to, as trespassers. And so uh, firm operators could not replace them with non-union workers or workers that didn't want to be on strike. And, uh, and so employers were just stuck. Uh, they weren't running their property, they weren't earning any income, and they were being held hostage by workers that, that the government uh, was sympathetic to. Uh, and these uh, sit-down strikes spread uh, in, in many parts of the country, particularly in uh, uh, big industries, uh, uh, making materials like uh, rubber and glass and automobiles and chemicals and steel and what have you. So there was a tremendous amount of uh, turmoil associated with labor relations uh, in the second half of the 1930s.
And the Roosevelt administration, by and large, had not only sponsored the legislation that made this turmoil possible, but it befriended, it had become allied with uh, the, the unions, particularly the, the CIO unions, which uh, had just come into being in that decade. Uh, Congress of Industrial Organizations was a new labor uh, umbrella organization to replace the old uh, AFL, the American Federation of Labor, which consisted mostly of craft unions or trade unions, carpenters, plumbers, what have you. CIO unions uh, weren't confined to specific uh, trades or, or crafts, but, but were, were wide scale. They might in, include as members everybody in an industry, uh, like in the automobile industry where the CIO unions organized. They included the machinists and the, and the guys carrying spare parts around the plant and everybody. Everybody could belong to the same uh, United Auto Workers. And that was one of the many unions that flourished in the late 1930s uh, under very radical leadership. Uh, now all this activity, uh, the government is growing, it's becoming more radical, its regulation is increasing, the president is hostile, he's threatening businessmen practically every day when he talks to the press. This created what I, I call regime uncertainty. Uh, it created the fear, uh, incalculable uh, outcomes. Uh, businessmen didn't know what the odds were that Roosevelt would become an economic dictator, but they thought he might. Uh, and so th the response to this fear was a paralysis. Uh, very few businessmen were willing to make long-term investments in this environment. And uh, that, I believe, was a major reason, perhaps the major reason, for the failure of private investment to recover in the 1930s, uh, particularly long-term investment. Now, uh, when, when uh, the war broke out in 1939, uh, Roosevelt immediately took an interest in uh, involving the United States in it. He, he, he was pro-war from the get-go. Uh, he didn't... Uh, announced neutrality exactly. He announced neutrality formally. He said, you know, the United States will remain neutral. Uh, but at the same time, in the very speech where he said that, he said, but, but we cannot remain neutral in, in spirit. Uh, you know, he, he obviously was uh, against the Germans. Uh, he was against the Japanese and who were waging war against China uh, in Asia. Uh, and he made no secret of it. Uh, and indeed, he began to work uh, behind the scenes from the very beginning uh, to take actions that would involve the United States uh, actively in uh, fighting alongside the British and, in the early days, the French, uh, against the Germans. Uh, the American people, however, were, were not interested in going back into a world war. They had almost all become disgusted by World War I in retrospect, and so they wanted to, to stay out. The polls showed even as late as uh, the latter part of 1941 that 75 or 80 percent of the American people did not want the United States to enter the World War. But Roosevelt, meanwhile, was taking all kinds of actions to, to build up the U.S. Armed Forces uh, with an eye toward their future engagement in the war. Now, in order to have a viable armed force, the United States needed not simply troops, uh, which could be obtained and were obtained by drafting them starting in the fall of 1940 when a new draft law was put into effect. Uh, but it had to have an, a military industrial sector, uh, firms that would produce raw materials that could be made into munitions and, and weapons platforms and firms that would create actual military products, uh, battleships, submarines, military tanks, armored vehicles, you name it. Uh, the United States did not have anything close to a military industrial sector at that time. It had demobilized almost completely in that respect after World War I. It had a very skeletal plan for mobilizing again, but very little substance had been put into that plan. Uh, and because of the hostility that Roosevelt had created among business people, uh, when the government undertook to enter into contracts with, with industrialists to, to create munitions or munitions-related products, uh, many, many of them, perhaps most of them, didn't want anything to do with it. They said, it's pointless to deal with the government. We don't trust them to even uh, come, 
agree with their contracts to carry them out, to do what they tell us they'll do. So uh, the government found itself in a bind in, uh, in 1940. Uh, and Roosevelt's way of dealing with it was, uh, was multifaceted. First of all, he, he brought in a new Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, who had previously been Secretary of War and Secretary of State and was a pillar of the Eastern Republican establishment. So it's as if he's saying to businessmen, look, we're going to put one of your favorite people in charge of the War Department. Certainly you can trust him when, when you deal with that department. Uh, and, of course, Stimson then was in a position to bring in uh, subordinates of his to, to handle day-to-day -day activities, which he did on a large scale, including Robert Patterson, who had been a, uh, a judge um, uh, to be Under Secretary of War, and uh, he, he was another Republican big shot. And so this was a way of placating business people, and then the War Department began to bring many private businessmen into the ranks of, uh, of the Pentagon or of uh, control agencies the government created afterwards to run the war economy. Now, uh, the president also brought Frank Knox in to be Secretary of the Navy. Knox had been the vice presidential candidate for the Republicans in 1936. He was a publisher, he was a, a, another you know, staunch Republican, and he brought uh, Forrestal to be his undersecretary of the Navy, Forrestal, been a Wall Street investment banker. And so this was the president's way of compromising, of cutting a deal with uh, the business sector to get their cooperation to build up the military industrial economy. Uh, uh, but uh, he, he also sponsored or had his administrators write up a variety of legal changes that in effect shifted the risks of war contractors onto the government and away from the private parties themselves. And there, this was done in a variety of ways uh, through the creation of new forms of loan guarantees, uh, uh, much faster write-offs of, uh, of durable investments and what have you. So there's a, uh, there's a a large number of actions the government took in 1940 and 41, which had the effect of almost guaranteeing profits for those uh, manufacturers and other private parties that would cooperate in the government's buildup for war. And so at that point, uh, uh, the nature of the administration changed. Okay? Now, the, the war becomes a giant industrial operation. Uh, most of the manufacturing output of the United States during the war was channeled into weaponry. Uh, uh, the big growth that seemed to be taking place in the American economy was all, all in uh, military-related activities. Uh, some economists have emphasized, oh, the government built new factories and plants and shipyards during the war, which is true. But it built them for military purposes. And many of them were so specific in their design and purpose that they had little or no value uh, for any other purpose. So when the war ended and the government put uh, many of those facilities up for sale, uh, it got pennies on the dollar uh, because, in fact, they weren't much good or, in many cases, no good at all uh, for civilian purposes. So uh, the idea that somehow the government's investments during the 1940 to 45 period in industrial facilities was uh, the reason for post-war prosperity uh, it, it's a very poor hypothesis. It doesn't stand up well at all. And it's just one of the ways in which people misunderstand the nature of the war economy itself. Uh, as you said before, the, the reigning understanding of that among economists has always been, from the time uh, of the war itself to the present, that it was a, a simple Keynesian episode. Government spent a lot of money, which it borrowed, uh, and, and voila, multiplier effects. And so everybody was, was in great shape. Uh, there was a carnival of consumption, as one historian described it. But this is bogus. There was no carnival of consumption. And in fact, uh, when we correct the data that are very misleading during the war because they don't take into proper account price controls and rationing and all sorts of government allocations of resources and prohibitions of various forms of uh, 
uh, production and what have you. When we take those things into account, it's very clear that consumers are worse off after 1941 uh, throughout the war. And it wasn't until the war ended that consumers were able to improve their situation uh, from what it had been uh, when the government declared war. So, so there is no carnival of consumption. There is no wartime prosperity. Uh, both private consumption and private investment fell, particularly private investment, because the government took over most of the investment uh, during the war years. And, and so the idea that uh, it was prosperous because production, G GNP or GDP went up uh, 70 or 80 percent during the war, it, it's, it's, it's just an accounting fiction. All you're doing is measuring the value of what government spent to make war. Uh, and that's a very different thing from uh, outputs that are validated in their value by, by consumers, ultimately, or by investors who re require consumer validation for their success. So the war prosperity was a, was a myth. Uh, it didn't happen. It wasn't real prosperity. Uh, and if we're serious about examining the data, uh, we can show that, and I believe I have shown it although there's still some dispute among uh, some economists with, with, with my own uh, demonstrations, but I'm, uh, I'm happy with them still. Uh, they could be improved, and I think if they are improved, they'll, they'll be even stronger support for my position. But however, however that may be, uh, the fact that the government was now being run by business-friendly people didn't help consumers or private investors during the war because everything was being channeled toward war. It was only when the war ended that this new, less hostile government could have the effect of encouraging a real recovery of private investment from the war. And that's because all of that regime uncertainty that had been created by the New Deal in the late 1930s had pretty much been washed away. Uh, Roosevelt died. Truman was not the same kind of radical that Roosevelt was. He had different kinds of subordinates running the government. They weren't the radical leftists that uh, had Roosevelt's ear in the late 1930s. And <clears throat> so when the war ended uh, and the war controls were taken off quite quickly, for the most part, uh, private investors and businessmen were ready to resume for the first time since 1929 a high level of activity, including a high level of private investment. So the year 1946 was just amazing. It was the most awesome single year in all of American economic history. Uh, private output in one year, private output of the economy increased by at least 30% in one year. And uh, nothing even half that large had ever been achieved before or later. It was just a unique episode. So. Uh, the, re the private economy recovered, recovered very quickly. The unemployment rate, which had been uh, very low during the war because millions of men had been drafted in the armed forces, and that eliminated all kind of reserve members of the labor force. Uh, uh, 10 million people were let out of the armed forces in the first year after the war, but the unemployment rate never rose above 4%. 4% would be glorious right now, wouldn't it? Uh, but it never got above 4% uh, after World War II. These, these people were almost seamlessly reintegrated into civilian life and civilian economic uh, activities. And, and, and I believe that was because uh, of the elimination of substantial regime uncertainty uh, as a result of the change in the character of government, which itself was brought about because of Roosevelt's necessity of uh, gaining the cooperation of business people in order to uh, effectively wage World War II. So that's a, a very quick and dirty uh, summary account of what uh, I have described at much greater length and in much greater detail in, uh, in various articles I wrote. And uh, they're collected in my book, uh, Depression, War, and Cold War, in the first five chapters. So in addition to understanding the historical episodes and, and, and providing um, an alternative history 
compared to the conventional view. Mm -hmm. One of the, the main takeaways that I, I think comes out of this strand of work um, is that when the government engages either in warfare or in security or defense, whatever you want to call it, it has to pull real resources out of the private sector. It has to redirect the entrepreneurial alertness of private actors, and it redirect those, redirects those things from, from satisfying consumer wants, private consumer wants, to satisfying the government. I think this is an important point beyond the episode of World War II because a lot of people to this day uh, make two, two related arguments. One is one you brought up earlier, which is the military Keynesianism type argument, which is that government spending on military or defense related activities somehow contributes to economic growth by stimulating spending. The second one is that government spending on security, defense, what, what have you, creates opportunities and products and services that otherwise wouldn't exist because mm -hmm. basically the government is, is sponsoring or subsidizing scientific research. Right. Um, do you see that this relating directly to some of the insights that, that you raise in, in this body of work? I, I do. Uh, I, I think the idea of regime uncertainty is a general idea. Uh, in fact, uh, I've been applying it to uh, uh, events since 2008 uh, when I've written a number of in this case, fairly small scale uh, uh, articles uh, to, to demonstrate that the same kinds of evidence I adduced to show regime uncertainty in the late 1930s have shown increases in regime uncertainty since 2008 as well. Uh, so I think that has uh, something important, I don't know how much, but something important to do with the uh, slow rate of recovery uh, from the, the uh, recession that began in the beginning of 2008 uh, and in some ways uh, has not ended yet even though we're now in uh, 2016. So th this, is a, this is a great duration uh, of its own. Uh, it's, it's not comparable of course with the magnitude of uh, the 1930s Great Depression but it, it's similar in kind and I believe it has uh, to some extent, a similar explanation. Uh, now, another thing I haven't touched on that that's, that you're now raising here is the is the question of how people react uh, when the government increases the level of regime uncertainty, and, and it's not simply that they 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 reduce the volume of long-term investment. It's that w what they do undertake is different in character. Uh, obviously, some people will will try to butter their bread by producing things the government wants. Uh, and if, for example, the government is subsidizing certain kinds of products or certain industries, then that will attract resources uh, to be invested in those places. So uh, nowadays, for example, the government subsidizes so-called green businesses and green enterprises. And th this almost always turns out to be just a way of wasting money on uh, paying large amounts of money to, to, to corporate cronies. Uh, but it, you know, it can be uh, uh, environmentally, uh, allegedly environmentally friendly automobiles, it can be uh, solar panels, or it can be all sorts of things that, that fly under this banner. Uh, but the fact is that now you've got investments being made, you're changing the structure of the capital stock in ways that would not be viable uh, without these government subsidies. Uh, uh, so even, even though you've had, uh, in both the late 1930s and since 2008, you've had a higher level of, of regime uncertainty, and that has discouraged uh, long-term investment in general, you've also had in both cases a distortion of the capital stock because of uh, where people choose to, uh, to restore the stock when it uh, becomes uh, old or depreciated, obsolete, uh, do, they, do they reinvest? Uh, in some cases they would, but for the regime uncertainty. In other cases they make new investments, even long-term investments, that they wouldn't make, uh, except that the government has mixed the regime uncertainty with subsidies and changes in regulation that, that make these investments look as if they're potentially profitable. So, so they're uh, when government intervenes, it, it, it creates many kinds of effects, and uh, it, 
The economist often sees on one or another of them, but, uh, but there, are, there are multiple effects and they interact because uh, when you distort the structure of, of production, you, you, you have an effect, for example, on the relative costs of raw materials and, and intermediate products in the industrial sector. And that is, in some ways, a bigger part of the economy than the final goods and services part. There's been some research to show that. In fact, there are even attempts now to systematically take into account how much economic activity is going on at the intermediate levels uh, that don't get taken into account by GDP accounting, where we, we look at only final, final goods and services when we add up the so-called total output of the economy. But, but of course, uh, a lot of action takes place within the capital structure itself. And when the government either creates uncertainty or, or distorts uh, production uh, with, with, uh, with tax changes, with, uh, with subsidies, with, with regulatory changes that affect different industries differently, it, it distorts the capital structure. And that has effects on the operation of, of unrelated activities and different kinds of outputs. So, you know, the economy is such a complex and delicately interrelated uh, web of evolving relationships and connections that, that it's, it's really impossible for anybody, even the most dedicated Austrian, uh, to identify all of these connections. They're, they're, they're almost endless. Uh, and that's uh, one of the reasons why uh, the the proposal to intervene uh, represents a level of hubris that uh, cannot withstand critical scrutiny. Uh, economics has become very interventionist ever since the 1920s, uh, not just in the United States, but uh, all over the world. And certainly macro intervention has swept the field since the 1940s. Uh, but the intervention is always based on a very impoverished conception of what the economy is and how it operates. A very simplified, mechanical, small scale, highly aggregated view. It's like this simple machine. Oh, you put uh, something in here and something pops out there. But in fact, the real economy is, is countless millions, hundreds of millions, billions of people, all doing things that if you track them close enough, relate to one another. We're all related, you know. It's not just that we all come from Adam and Eve and we're related that way. <laughs> we, uh, uh, we're, we're all related right now in this huge world through the intricacies of the, uh, of the great division of labor that, that uh, Adam Smith uh, visualized for us uh, perhaps well for the first time and, uh, and, and others, uh, particularly Austrians, have have visualized uh, uh, in a more uh, in a precise way uh, from time to time uh, since then. But, but uh, uh, Austrian economics does not lend itself well to uh, interventionism uh, at all because uh, it, it, it's aware of the hubris that has to sustain those interventions. I want to discuss the Independent Review. Uh, you were the founding editor. Uh, the journal was founded in 1995. Uh, the first issue was published a year later in 1996. And then uh, you were the editor for 17 years. And so I was hoping you'd uh, talk a little bit about the origins of the journal, the aims and scope, uh, the space that you see it filling, mm -hmm. uh, and also any uh, stories or, or, or experiences that you might have had mm -hmm. being an editor for uh, 17 years, which I'm sure was an interesting experience. <laughs> uh, the. the the journal really uh, was uh, the project that David Thoreau, the president of the Independent Institute, uh, set in motion. He wanted to have a journal, um, and uh, he had been associated with the original uh, creation of the Cato Journal uh, way back uh, in the 1970s. And, uh, and when, <clears throat> when he had his own organization, the, the Independent Institute, he wanted to have uh, a similar kind of journal. Uh, so he had spoken to me when I uh, began to work as research director in 1994 for the Institute about creating a journal and about my editing it 
uh, I, was, I wasn't very enthusiastic, frankly. I, I thought there were too many journals already, and we would just be one more that uh, would have trouble finding readers. But David uh, would not relent, uh, and so it, we ended up going ahead and beginning to plan a journal from scratch, which was interesting because we had to decide everything, you know, what size paper, what kind of font would the journal be printed in, and so forth. Uh, so it, it involved a lot of work, and uh, he and I and uh, the um, publications director at the time uh, were the three people who who did all that work in answering those questions and deciding what the journal would look like. And, and as editor, my job was basically to decide what would go inside the covers. Uh, other than advertising, I never, thank goodness, was responsible for the ads, but uh, all the substantive content was my responsibility. And uh, both David and I agreed that uh, we didn't simply want another economics journal. Uh, because our, our interests were broader than that, and uh, we thought there were lots of important things that fell outside the usual bounds of economics that we would like uh, the Institute to, to, to be involved in, uh, in some way. So, uh, from the very beginning, uh, I knew that I wanted to include contents that were historical, that dealt with uh, politics and law and, and philosophy, uh, and not just economics. Uh, and so that's the kind of journal we created, and it's remained uh, true to that conception ever since. Um, uh, it, we also, well, again, I decided that I, I wouldn't have a fixed formula. I wouldn't say the articles must all be of a certain type. They must all have the same architecture. They must all, you know, kind of look 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 identical, except that you know the, the words were, were variable. <laughs> so I, I I used special features. I used uh, sometimes graphics to to uh, do things, you know, like include photographs, for example, or uh, unusual charts or uh, things of that sort. I, uh, I entertained uh, kind of oddball feature articles. But uh, as it turned out, I think uh, people uh, responded very nicely to those unusual aspects of the journal. They, they, they liked having things that weren't just boringly uh, uh, the same uh, from one article to the next and from one issue to the next. And so, so the journal has, uh, has, has been varied uh, in uh, the disciplines uh, it covered in the substance, uh, the, the form of exposition, the kind of analysis. Uh, what I did insist on was, uh, was good quality thinking. Uh, I didn't want any kind of slipshod or propagandistic or bombastic writing in the journal. I, I didn't want it to be a journal uh, with an ideological mission. I, I, I expressed at the very beginning the idea that the journal's pages would be open to people of varying uh, views, uh, and, uh, and that didn't mean I was going to include a lot of uh, Marxism-Leninism, uh, because I wasn't that open. But I, I did have, a, uh, I think, a fairly liberal uh, view of what I was willing to entertain, and it wasn't simply things I agreed with. So a great deal appeared in the journal over the years that I did not personally agree with, but that's fine. That wasn't wasn't supposed to be the case ever, but uh, uh, the, uh, the, the difficulty in founding a new journal like that is, is in getting a steady flow of high quality contributions from authors. Uh, and so that was a big part of my work over those 17 years that I edited the journal, uh, was beating the bushes, uh, finding the best people I could to contribute to the journal. And as it turned out, uh, some excellent people did uh, uh, contribute, and some excellent articles are there in those, uh, uh, those issues. Um, uh, the authors make the journal. You know, an editor doesn't make the journal. But there were things that I could do, and so I worked hard at them. And one of them was 
uh, working on the writing, on the exposition itself, not just on the substance. I, I could often make suggestions or, or Im even impose requirements about the, the substance, but, but I could always uh, be of some assistance uh, in improving the writing. Uh, good writing is not generally emphasized much among economists uh, or other social scientists uh, or philosophers or lawyers or anybody else. So academic writing is, is, is by and large pretty bad. Uh, but I think what we did succeed in doing at the Independent Review was, uh, was uh, creating a journal that, in which the contents were well written, they were clear, they were precise, they, they did not use a lot of gobbledygook or unnecessary jargon. They did not contain any show-off formalism. Uh, most mainstream journals are replete with show-off formalism. Uh, uh, a lot of math that, that, that's unnecessary, that contributes to nothing, it's there because that's what people have to do to establish that they're, they're, uh, they're competent. Uh, but uh, I personally believe most of that is wasted effort. It's not that I'm opposed to formalism as such or mathematics as such, uh, but I would like to see it used where it's appropriate and necessary, not when it's just there to show the flag of formalism. So the journal uh, has had statistical analyses. It, you know, it's had econometrics. It's, it's had some mathematics, uh, but not a lot. Uh, not nearly what you would find in uh, a typical economics journal. Now, as a result of that, the journal has been accessible to non-professionals. And many of our readers have been lay people or students. Uh, and, and for the most part, I would say that, that such people can read through a journal and understand everything there. There, there are a few exceptions where they might have, have trouble, but, but they're unusual. And I think... Uh, my decision to, to have an exhibition like that uh, was good because uh, if I'd thought, well, we want to have, you know, we want to compete with Econometrica, uh, we would have been a flop because we couldn't compete with Econometrica. No, you know, world-class econometrician was going to send a manuscript to the Independent Review. So th we would have had a lot of rotten econometrics by fourth-rate econometricians. But, what we could do was get people who were good economists or good historians or good philosophers, uh, uh, good lawyers. We could get them to write high quality uh, expositions uh, that were, uh, by the time they came out, they were well written and accessible to a wide audience. So I I'm pretty happy with the way the journal worked out in that respect. So Bob has been spending the past academic year with the Hayek program as the uh, F.A. Hayek Distinguished Visiting Professor. Uh, and you spent several weeks with us in the fall semester and, and now several weeks with us uh, now in the spring 2016 semester. Uh, and so I was hoping you'd tell us a little bit about uh, your time here and, and your thoughts on the Hayek program and how you see it fitting into to the broader mm -hmm. um, academic profession. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, first of all, it's a great honor for me uh, to be here in that capacity, Chris. Uh, I'm uh, a huge fan of, uh, of what uh, you and your colleagues do at George Mason and have been for a long time. Uh, I think y your uh, training of graduate students is unique uh, and I love the way you go about it and I think you've been tremendously successful against many obstacles in uh, training your students well and, and uh, putting them in a position to succeed professionally and you've got some, some great people out there uh, working very actively today who are products of your, of your training and mentoring. So uh, it's uh, splendid for me to have the opportunity to be, be a part of it in a very small way. Now, uh, I'm, of course, uh, talking to graduate students and, uh, and meeting with, with some of them, uh, uh, both in, in sessions and outside. And, and uh, I'm available to, to read uh, things that they might like me to uh, evaluate for them and uh, to do whatever I can to, to help them out as, the, as a high visiting professor. So uh, uh, it, it gives me an opportunity to associate with, with wonderful students, highly motivated students, able students in a way that uh, I normally wouldn't have. I, I've been out of formal academia for a long time. 
myself, so I don't have any students of my own in the usual sense, but, but I do think of some of the young people I've been able to, to mentor or help along over the years as, as kind of my students once removed, and I'm very proud of uh, their accomplishments. And uh, a, a number of them are George Mason students, so it's a joy for me to be here, actually, and um, I just uh, think Pete Becky deserves the highest accolades uh, for his leadership and and uh, what you're doing now, uh, you yourself, uh, but uh, and many of the other people at, at George Mason. George Mason has been my academic home away from home since the 1980s. I've I've, I've come here often in, in one way or another to lecture for the outreach program or to you know lecture to the Public Choice Center. Or, I come here for IHS uh, uh, programs, what have you. So um, I love the place. I think it's uh, it's wonderful. It's doing uh, doing the Lord's work. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to the Hayek Program podcast. To learn more about the research, scholars, and work of the FA Hayek Program, visit ppe.mercatus.org.